Welcome to our channel. Hi. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, one of our cases of uh, foster care abuse. We're probably starting with the most heartbreaking case that I think I've ever researched at all. Uh, Alexandria Lynn Hill. Mm -hmm. But first, before we get into that, we figured we'd catch you up on some of the stuff that we've been doing and what we plan on doing. So... Well, other than work, which is a lot of what we do, um, we went to Indiana to spend time with Mike's family for the holidays. Okay. Um, so I had a big family get together there. Lots of fun. Lots of screaming kiddos. What'd you do while I was gone? Work. <laughs> I worked seven days straight. One day off this week. Tomorrow. So excited. I'm going to sleep. I think I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to sleep. Well, today's my day off, so no sleep. And it's not your day off because we're working. Right. Um, I do know that we, I want to start vlogging at some point. Maybe letting people get to know us better, see what our lives are like, because my house is chaotic all the time. I'm not. Sorry, guys, I'm adjusting our light. Yeah, you're blinding me in the process. Sorry. It's okay. It's cool. Y'all excuse me, I'm <clears throat> sucking on a vitamin C drop, having some congestion issues this week. Yes. Kentucky weather. Yeah. <laughs> Allergies are horrible in Kentucky. I am going to try not to say um so much in this video, because the last video, I don't know, like, it's a tick. Well, I'll tell you what. You try not to say, um, and I'll try not to do the thing with my lips. Oh, like when we were watching the video back and you were like, I don't know what to do with my face when you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. Exactly. Have you figured out what to do with your face? <laughs> no, it's Did just you, kind of attached to my You head. should practice that. You should practice what to do with your face. Okay. Sorry, guys. This my is... chihuahua is whining in the background wanting to get in. I feel like a podcast would be easier for me because <laughs> I don't have to control my face. Well, we could do some kind of podcast. That would be fun. I don't, it's a face thing. <laughs> my, I enjoy not being on camera. So. My face is going to be the death of me. <laughs> Trying to figure out how that would happen. <laughs> if my mouth doesn't say it, my face will. It's true. So now not only is there a chihuahua at my door, my daughter's at my door. Chasing the chihuahua. Chasing the chihuahua and yelling at her to get away from the door. Yeah, we and can hear her too. You'll see in the back corner there behind Sabrina that there happens to be a pit bull, or as we like to call him, a pibble. Pibble. Um, he's, he's a big baby. Huge baby. He is, he's over 100 pounds, and he uh, likes to sit in your lap and snuggle. He gets that from his dad. So she has his dad. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we said that's, that on the last that's one. That's my nephew slash grandson. Yeah. 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 She's awkward. <laughs> We're all awkward. <laughs> I know. He's biting, biting himself. Oh, well. So. Yeah, background noise. Of course. So are you ready to just jump <clears throat> into this and. Um, yeah. Talk about Alex. Um, we do have our laptop. If you see us looking down, we have a laptop with all of our notes because we're still new at this and we don't want to mess up too badly. Right. We'll get better. We will. Maybe. Possibly. <laughs> so, today we're going to be talking about Alexandria Hill. Alexandria Lynn Hill was born on November 7th of 2010. She was 6 pounds, 5 ounces. And she was born after 18 and a half hours of labor and then an emergency C-section. Despite her scary interest into the world, Alex was an amazing baby. She was never sick, always happy and healthy. And when she was just a few days old, she started sleeping through the night. Um, when Alex got a little older, she loved to dance. She loved Alvin and the Chipmunks and Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium. Which one of was, your favorite oh, movies. One of my favorite movies. She loved to run, play, explore. 
Um, and unfortunately, this beautiful little girl only made it to two years old. Now, the story that um, we're going to be going through, we got most of it from the mother. Yes. So, we just want to put that out there that, you know, some of this, we're not stating facts. If we, if we say something about how someone acted or... I mean, obviously, we weren't there. We didn't see it. Right. And everything wasn't put into the reports, the all the articles that we went through. And I got a hold of the mother of Alex through her Facebook page. And she agreed to go over the story with us. So, a lot of the, the stuff is from the viewpoint of the mother, Mary Sweeney. So... I'm just putting that out there before we get started with this story. Do you want to go read about the parents? <clears throat> yeah. All right. So, the parents were Josh Hill and Mary Sweeney. They met in 2009. They met through mutual friends. He was at the time a marijuana dealer, and Mary thought that she could change him. She did smoke pot at the time, but she thought that it would be better for Josh to get a job. Um, in May of 2009, Josh and Mary moved in together. Mary had two jobs, her own car, and they moved into a nice apartment. Within two months, Mary lost both of her jobs, and they lost the apartment. They ended up having to live with friends. <clears throat> Mary said she was brainwashed by Josh. And all of a sudden, he'd convince her that they could start a family and he would take care of everything. In February of 2010, Mary found out she was pregnant. It was then that she realized she didn't want to have a baby with Josh, and now she was stuck. Mary said that Josh was a habitual liar, a manipulator, and a control freak. Now again, that's Mary. those are the words of Mary Sweeney. Uh, she was the one that we reached out to and got the story from so do not blame us for anything that's said about josh in this right we're we're only telling the story that we were told from her point of view and also from articles that we did right. find and we will be adding a link for the main article that we used and we're also going to add a link for mary sweeney's facebook page justice for alex now at six months pregnant, Mary went to the hospital for chest infection. After being treated for two hours, the doctor said she was good to go. They were just going to take her up to labor and delivery and check on Alex, make sure everything was good with the pregnancy. Um, all of a sudden, Mary started feeling really tired. And then the next thing she knew, she woke up in a hospital room with Josh and her mother and all these doctors standing around her. And they asked her if she knew what happened. And she said no. She said, I just thought we were going up to labor and delivery to check on Alex. The doctor said, no, you just had a grand mal seizure. They didn't really know what was going on with that. What had caused it. Right. Um, but she didn't have another one until Alex was a couple of months old. And then they lasted until October of 2012. Now, um, Mary and Josh argued a lot, and they continued to argue after Alex was born. Josh decided it would be a good idea if they moved to Cameron, Texas, to be around his parents. He told Mary that she could either come with him and Alex or stay there with her mom. And, of course, she went with Josh to stay with Alex. Right. She wanted to be with her daughter. So, now Mary said that Josh was very controlling. She was never allowed to hang out with her own friends. She was never allowed to go anywhere without Josh. So, when they moved to Texas, she was really excited because Josh got a job and she got to know her next door neighbor, Karen. She was in the same complex as Josh and Mary. And they became best friends, and she knew she could confide in Karen about anything that was going on. She told she told her everything about her relationship with Josh. Um, Josh was still smoking pot at this point, even though Mary had begged him to quit. So, when she woke Josh up one afternoon to help her with Alex, 
he went outside to smoke instead. And this caused a huge argument between both of them. His sister showed up and the cops ended up being called. Mary took Alex to Karen's apartment along with Josh's sister. Josh showed up banging on the door and he demanded to see Alex. They, they said no. He was met with a resounding no. He said he only wanted to tell her goodbye. Um, so they cautiously opened the door. And at that point, Josh grabbed Alex and tried to run out the door. And when he did that, he almost hit Alex's head on a brick pillar. So that's when his sister called CPS. So throughout the articles that we've been reading, nobody could tell us who called CPS. We right. actually got that information from Mary Sweeney. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually Josh's own sister that called CPS on him. So what it's sounding like is that CPS was called basically because of Josh's control and anger issues. Yes. Okay. And the fact that he almost harmed Alex. Right. But when they got there, he admitted to smoking weed, but he also told CPS workers that Mary wasn't allowed to be left alone with Alex due to her seizures. And that wasn't true. There were no doctor orders saying that that she wasn't allowed to be left alone with Alex. There was no reason that she couldn't care for Alex just because she had seizures. Right. Um, she admitted that she used to smoke pot. Yes. Yeah, but she passed a drug test. And despite this, just because it is against the law to, to smoke weed in Texas, they took Alex and they placed her in the home of Josh's parents. Now, this scared Mary a lot because Josh's dad was convicted of... He was a convicted sex offender with a minor. And Josh convinced Mary that his dad would never touch Alex. So, even though he begged, CPS still found out. But first, she was placed with him for a month. Alex was placed in that home for a month, and Mary couldn't even see her for her second birthday. She completely missed Alex's second birthday. But then CPS did find out about Josh's dad being a, a registered sex offender. So Alex was sent to her first foster home. Now, she was only in that home for two months, um, but she came home to visits or to the location where they did visits. Right. They did supervised visits. But she came to those visits with unexplained bruises on her. Mm -hmm. And she also, they found mold in the bottom of her diaper bag. And I don't even know what would cause that. I mean, the only thing I can think of is like spilled milk. Like maybe, well, she would have been too old for formula. But like spilled milk. And they didn't clean it out good. Maybe it sat down in there. And But how long would milk have to sit in there in order to get moldy? A while, I would think. Too long. Ugh. Alex got really sick for the very first time. She had never really been sick in her life. Uh, maybe a cold here and there. But she had never been really sick. for. The, and this was the first time. So they fought with CPS about this foster home. And at the end of January 2013, 30-pound, blonde hair, blue-eyed Alex was moved to her third and final foster home. Let's talk about Cheryl Small. Oh, yes. That name just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. <clears throat> Cheryl Small was in her 50s. She had lost her job as a school bus driver after falling and injuring her wrist. Her husband, Clemens Small, was a recovering cocaine addict that worked a few days a week as a karaoke DJ. Now, let's just talk about that for a second because I also found a couple of other things that just don't make sense. When Cheryl first became a foster parent, she was facing theft charges and they still approved so her. So, she actually not only had a previous previous criminal history but she was facing current criminal charges yes and he was a recovering cocaine addict 
and he also had charges for marijuana in the past. Oh, so we can't let the parents keep her because they smoke marijuana. But the foster parents can. Cheryl's two adult daughters also, they frequented, frank, frequented, frequented, they frequented Cheryl's house and they both had a criminal history. And see that, as we know, because you're a foster parent, is a no-no. Everybody that's in my life, on not even a daily basis, but no, if but they... but a halfway regular basis. Yeah, I they, have to have a drug, a drug test, drug a background test, check. Background check um, fingerprints. Fin FBI fingerprints, yeah. yes. Like, anybody that's in my life, like, they're not foster parents. I'm the only one, but they have to have all of my family's information, my friends, anybody that's going to be around these kids on a regular basis, right, they because... have to have all of their information. And somebody just turned my TV on. Well, I was going to say because they want to know. They need to know that these children are safe when they're put into your care. Right. Sorry. And also that there's a ghost that turns the, your the TV on. The dogs can't turn my TV on. And I just happened to notice that my TV was turned on. So, yeah. Ghost. I, my house is haunted. <clears throat> Maybe we'll talk about that one day. Ooh, fun. Anyways, back to the story, <clears throat> please. They, you know, they do need to know all of the information because it's not just the foster parents. No, they anybody that's supposed to other people. Yeah, anybody that's around those kids, they have to have their information so that they know that that kid is safe no matter what, no matter who's in that house. Um. So, Mary. No, no, no not Mary. So, Cheryl and Clemens Small became foster parents after a friend recommended they become foster parents due to their money problems. When Alex Hill was placed in their home on Jan in January of 2013, Cheryl also had an infant. Mm -hmm. She was paid $44.30 a day by mentor to care for the foster children. Yep. Um, her sister, Donna, yes, Cheryl's sister, Donna, said that Cheryl was only in foster care for the money. She also said that she did not like Alex. How can you even be a foster parent and not like the child, not like a child, any child? I don't know, but her, the infant had everything in her room, but... Alex, her room was devoid of any kind of decoration, any toys, anything that you would expect to see when you walk into a child's room. Right. Now, the infant had all of that. Yes. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't Cheryl's granddaughter that lived with her have all of that? I think so, yes. Um, now, I could be mistaken on that one. That's just something I seem to recall. Don't it's quote not. us. Don't ever quote us. No, please don't. That would get you in lots of trouble anytime you think about it. Um... But Cheryl had actually, she worked for Mentor, which we'll do a whole video on this company. Yes, they please. are apparently a horrible foster parent company. It's, they don't check anybody, as you can see. They just want homes to put these kids in. They don't, they don't do any kind of checks on them. But she had reported to Mentor that she was stressed out by fostering these kids she was already stressed but this this didn't surprise the family that she was acting this way so apparently that was just in her nature to act that way well it, it's in her nature and no excuses for her at all because this woman this vile woman deserved everything she got but cheryl was a foster child herself she was beaten and put in isolation um so, in her early teen years, she ran away from foster care and ended up living with a man that raped her all the time, repeatedly. But she said at one point that this was okay. It was, being raped was better than being beaten and left outside, which her foster parents did do a lot. They would leave her outside, lock the doors on cold nights. And not let her in the house. And she said that being raped by this guy was better than that. So she stayed with him for a while. And when she was younger, she also, she had a son. But she put him up for adoption. Which I think was the best choice 
Well, Just given what happens later on, obviously it was the best choice. But she did go on to have three daughters when she was older. At one point, all three of these daughters were raised by their paternal grandparents. Cheryl was known as a wild street woman. That is not my word. Those are not my words. No. That was... Um, In the article. Yes, the paternal grandfather said that's what she was known as. Mm. Um, one of the children, one of her daughters was eventually adopted by their grandparents. She was seven when this happened because Cheryl said she was too defiant. And one time Cheryl even hit her two-year-old daughter so hard that she fell down and it gave her a black eye and a knot on her head. And once again, I have to go back with all of this was somewhere. All of this was reported at one time or another. How did she end up a foster parent? Right. People knew. Everybody had to have known how she was with children. This couldn't be a surprise. It had to be in the system of her child being too defiant. So she was adopted by other family members. You know, it had to be in the file that they raised her other two children while she ran the streets. Right. It had to be somewhere. They just didn't check. They just needed a home. And Cheryl needed money. So it was the perfect combination. Hmm. Now we're going to get into the buildup of the situation. All right. <clears throat> so Mary and Josh, they thought that Alex was safe with Cheryl and Clement. They never met them. But CPS seemed sure that this was a good placement for Alex. Soon, however... They began to see bruises on their small child again, and Alex seemed to be acting lethargic. Um, they had a one-hour visit with her once a week, up until Josh failed a drug test. Of course. Um, then Mary got two hours once a week. She gained Josh's she, hour. Right. She gained yeah. his hour, so she was getting two hours rather than just an hour. Right. Um, but... That stressed Alex out even more. I mean, there were too many changes going on. Right. At such a young right. age. She was two years old and, you know, she's being bounced around from house to house. And the only consistency is seeing her parents, the people that she knows and loves every right. week, and then one of them goes away. Exactly. So you've got to think, what would this do to a normal, like an adult, a fully developed, mentally cognizant adult? Right. And then you take a two-year-old and do that exact same thing and to them. And she doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't understand right. anything. She doesn't know why she's not seeing mommy and daddy on a regular basis. She doesn't know where everybody went. All she knows is that she's getting thrown around from one home to another. Right. And then she's getting to see mommy and daddy once a week. But then daddy goes away. Right. This stressed her out so much that she began to pull her own hair out. To the point that... By the time she she did pass away, she only had a little bit of hair on the very top of her head. That's all that was left. Because of the abuse, because of the stress, she pulled her own hair out to, to the point where she was almost bald. That, and somewhere, I think Mary said that they gave her Flintstone vitamins for this, for pulling her hair out. Because pulling your hair out's a vitamin deficiency? I, I guess. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, they gave her daily vitamins and Flintstone multivitamins because she was pulling her hair out. Well, while all this was going on, things between Mary and Josh finally came to a head and Mary moved out. Good. She was told later... That if she had done this sooner, if she had left Josh sooner, she could have had Alex back right away. Right away. But they didn't tell her that or she would have left sooner. I know. She thought that she could help Josh recover from what she told me. She thought that she could help Josh recover to help them get Alex back. But if they had just told her that, hey, he is the one keeping you from getting your child. Right. If you leave she him, would have you been, have her back. She would have been gone in the beginning. She she would have gotten Alex back right away. Well, so Mary moved in with her best friend, Karen. Mm -hmm. 
uh, whom she had actually begun to fall in love with. Right. And uh, she got a new caseworker that was consistent with her drug tests. Awesome. Her checkups. Uh, she was his first case, but he seemed to be doing a great job. Yeah. Now, July 11th of 2013, Mary went to court for the last time. The judge looked over the entire case and then looked at the caseworker and he wanted to know if there was any reason that Alex shouldn't go home with Mary that day. He wanted to send her home that day. And the caseworker said there was no reason she shouldn't. There was no reason that Alex couldn't go home with her mom and that day. Mary was so happy at that point. In that moment, she was so happy. But then they realized that the caseworker supervisor was there and... The supervisor stood up and said that that was why he was there. Um, he said that the, the caseworker was new and hadn't done a home check on Karen. But even the though, old caseworker had. Yes, the old caseworker had already done a home check. I don't know why it wouldn't have been in the file. It should have been, but it wasn't. And also, they had a problem with Mary not having a job yet. But... Her and Karen only had one car, and Karen had a job, a really good job, that she needed the car for. But Karen even told the judge that her job would support all three of them, that she had no problem with, with Alex coming home with them, and she would support all of them until they could get another car and Mary could get her own job because that was her plan. And she also, she had already complied with orders to go to parenting classes and go to therapy. And she hadn't had a seizure since October. Right. Two months before they even took, no, a month before they even took Alex away from them. Right. So, all this time, Alex has been gone. Mary hasn't had a seizure. Right. And she's complied with every single thing. The only thing was she didn't have a job at that time. and But they still had a way to take care of her. Right. And that's another thing is, you know, Cheryl and Clemen, they did this for the money. They, they were not stable. They didn't have a no. stable income. But they got foster kids but mary couldn't have her own child back because she herself did not have a stable income tell me how that makes any sense to me it doesn't to you it doesn't to most people watching this it won't but the judge didn't agree he didn't and on july 23rd 2013 mary had her last visit with alex they met at an indoor playground that Alex loved. Their usual two-hour visit, this last visit, was cut down to one hour because Cheryl had to take the other foster child to the doctor, and she said she had to have Alex back in order to do that. But during the visit, Alex didn't seem like herself. Yeah, Mary said instead of snuggling with her and sitting in her lap with one arm around her, rubbing her back like they always did. Like Mary always did to her. Right. Alex was running around stealing toys from other children on the playground, kept running away from Mary, just completely acting like a different child. She kept running away from Mary, and I don't really know what this was about. Maybe she thought, you know, if I spend this time with her right now, then she'll leave after so long. Um, maybe she <clears throat> thought running and doing this could prolong right, the, make visit the visit longer because she didn't want to go home or back, back to Cheryl's. To the, yeah. It's not home. No. Um, but finally it was time to go. And when Mary told Alex that it was time to go, Alex threw herself to the ground, thrashing around and throwing a horrible fit like Mary had never seen before. But Mary took Alex to the car and she said goodbye to her daughter. The last thing that she said before she left was, I love you so much. <sighs> On July 29th, 2013, Cheryl Small's sister Donna stopped by for a visit. When she walked into the Small's home, 
she noticed Alex was standing alone in a room called the Man Cave. She was facing the wall and the room was completely dark. Now Cheryl told her sister that Alex was in trouble for waking up before them, going to the kitchen and getting herself some food and water. Apparently, I guess Cheryl had stayed up till like one or two in the morning because she was upset over something. So she slept in and Alex was thirsty and hungry. I mean, and if she knew how to get it herself, why not let her get it? She was, she didn't bother you. No. She didn't wake you up, but she, she it didn't frustrated cause any her. damage. It frustrated no her damage. and it, it made her mad. So, you know, you, you put the two-year-old in basically a timeout. You put her in the corner, okay? Right. But foster care, and this is every state. Every, every state. state has a rule that with timeout, if you're going to use timeout, they can stay in timeout. The minutes in timeout have to equal their age. So, with Alex being two years old, she should have been in timeout for a two total minutes. of two minutes. And yet, Donna was there for two hours at least. And two-year-old Alex, who should have been in the corner for two minutes, never moved from that room. We found out later that it was actually, I think, a total of four hours that Alex stood in that dark room with nothing but her teddy bear. And just stare. So, we found out that it was actually four hours instead of two. Right. And that that baby was just standing there, staring at a wall with her teddy bear for four hours. At about a quarter to seven that night, Clemens Small woke up from a nap and headed out to a meeting at a nearby restaurant. Fifteen minutes later, he received a call from Cheryl telling him to come home. Then she called 911. When Chief Rodham of Rockdale Volunteer Fire Department showed up to the Smalls residence, Alex's limp body lay on the floor. Clemen was sitting on the couch and Cheryl was on the phone with 911 and he noted that there was mucus on Alex's mouth, suggesting that CPR had never even been attempted. Which, once again, foster parents were taught CPR. You're trained in CPR. Every year. They make sure you know this. In case of an emergency, the first thing you do, call 911, perform CPR. But it's not that she didn't even know how to do it. She didn't even try. Right. She didn't even try to save her. So... He did note that both Cheryl and Clemen seemed strangely calm. They really didn't care about what was going on. They they weren't worried about it. No. They called nine one one, and then it was up to them to take care of it, and yeah. it was it out didn't of their affect hands. them at all. So, Alex was rushed to Scott and White Children's Emergency Hospital in Temple, Texas. She was hooked up to a ventilator and a brace was placed on her neck. Uh, Cheryl never seemed upset and never asked the police or the doctors if Alex was okay. She didn't seem concerned at all. She had to go to the hospital because the police officers wanted to question her. Right. But she didn't care how Alex was doing. No. She never asked. She never cried. She was fine the entire time. No concern at all. Alex was kept on life support until July 31st of 2013. After being unplugged, Mary was allowed to hold little Alex for the last 15 minutes of her short life. The autopsy report showed bruising on Alex's legs, cheek, chin, shoulders, behind her ear, lower back, and most severely on the top of her head. She also had a bruise on her buttocks that was in the shape of a belt, which means these people were beating her with a belt. Um, she had subdural hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging and subarachnoid hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging 
which um, I'm not sure I told you. I know I told you. I'm not sure where it's written. It's bleeding between the brain and, and the... And the tissue that covers the brain. Yes. And while looking that up, because I was just... I curious. didn't know anything about it. I was curious. I found that of the people that do survive a subarachnoid hemorrhage, 66% of them suffer some neurological deficit for the rest of their life. So some sort of brain damage was probable. Right. And only about 15%, or I'm sorry, not only, but approximately 15% of all patients with the subarachnoid hemorrhage actually die before they ever even reach a hospital. Well, Alex didn't. She was on life support. Um, but she also had retinal hemorrhaging in both of her eyes. This poor baby's eyes were so swollen. She didn't even look like herself. I'm not going to put the pictures up. And I told the mother that I wouldn't do that. I'll have pictures of Alex and her mother on here. But I would never put the pictures of that poor baby in the hospital. It was just a horrible sight. She she didn't look like the same child at all. And that's not how she needs to be remembered. No. She also had two tears on her liver, and it caused one-third of her total blood volume to pool inside of her abdomen. This prevented oxygen from reaching her brain and in turn caused her liver to fail. And also, five out of seven of her cervical vertebrae, which are the vertebrae in your neck, right. were broken. Yeah, that's why they had the brace on her neck when, when they got her to the hospital. So, the day after... Was it the day after? I think it was the day after. The day after poor little Alex passed away. Cheryl Small was arrested and charged with capital murder. And good for them. But she lied to the police multiple times before she ever told the truth. She told them that Alex had been running backwards through the house and fell. Then she changed the story and said she was playing with Alex, spinning her over her head, and accidentally dropped her. Which... I mean, we've, I play with little kids and, but I've always caught them. And even if they were to fall, it would never cause that amount of damage. Well, no, because the normal person is doing everything in their power to try and catch right, that child. Right, right. Which would break some of the impact of that fall. Right. Plus, the floor in this home <sighs> was carpeted. It was carpeted. Imagine. Everything that was shown in the autopsy, imagine everything that was wrong with this child that caused her to end her life. It was carpeted. She hit her on, she threw her on carpet. How hard do you have to exactly. slam so that's, a child against carpet? That's not an accidental drop. That's a forceful throw. She finally admitted to the police that she was she was frustrated with Alex. So she picked her up repeatedly and slammed this child headfirst into the carpeted floor. I'll never understand how anyone could do something like that. I really won't. The trial only lasted a week. It was in the fall of 2014. And the jury, smart people that they were... Only deliberated for four hours. Four hours, folks. That's awesome. That's, That's always good. Yeah. The shorter the deliberation, the quicker they know she did it. Exactly. Uh, Cheryl Small was found guilty of capital murder, and she was sentenced to life in prison by Judge John W. Youngblood on November 7th, 2015, which would have been Alex's fourth birthday. But Cheryl died in prison in December of 2016 from colon cancer. She was in the Texas Department of Corrections Murray unit near Gatesville. Um, she... Now, um, right before she died, her attorneys appealed the verdict. It was in May of 2016. They argued that Youngblood 
limited her expert medical witness testimony and didn't read in open session a note the jury sent to Youngblood during deliberations. But the court ruled against both points of appeal. So she was denied appeal right before she died uh, in December of 2016. Now, she, she was in jail. She was in prison less time than Alex was alive. Right. I don't think she... Got her punishment. Yeah, I don't think she got exactly what she deserved. No, I fully. Mean, think of how many years she took away from Alex and 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 Alex's mother. How many years could they have had together? And she died a year after being convicted of this horrible, horrible murder. And there's so many other cases that are just like this in the foster care system. These poor children, just like Alex are being used for money. And if you look at everything, these foster parents are doing the same exact things that the biological parents are doing. But the difference is they're getting paid for it. Yeah. And the biological parents get their children taken away and given to strangers that do the exact same things. Now, don't get us wrong. We're not saying that it's okay to do a lot of these things because some things those kids don't need to be exposed to. Right. But you can't take a person's child just because they have seizures. No. It doesn't work that way. That's the law shouldn't be able to take your child from you just because of a medical condition that epilepsy is seen as a disability and you can't hold that against somebody. No. And the doctors never said no. that Mary couldn't be left alone with no, her child. that was out of his mouth. Not a doctor's. Not anybody's, but his. But... I, this is just so horrible. I don't even know how to come back from this at this point. Right. But... Mary and Karen did move to Colorado to to start over, to yes. start fresh. They they're happy. Good girls. They're We're happy. They're married, <laughs> which is awesome. Go you. Right. Um, and they're trying to work through it. Alex will never be forgotten. Never. And that's that's one part of the reason we wanted to do this video because. You know, yeah, this happened years ago, but we want Mary to know that we will never forget Alex. And we want other people to know that this is happening. There are foster parents out there that aren't taking care of these children. And even worse, they're abusing them. They're murdering them. And they're... Don't cry again. <laughs> but I want you to know that this isn't coming... We're not anti-foster care. I, no. I'm a foster parent. So, I think it, it does seem a little better coming from me and my sister. Because we deal with the system every single day. But in dealing with it, we know how it should be done. Right. And, you know, not every... There are a lot of good homes out there. Yes. There are a lot of people that do this for the right reasons. They take these children in and they change their lives completely. They either help the parents and help the child go home to their parents. Or, you know, if, if that can't be helped, they will adopt that child. Or make sure that they find the right adoptive parents. You know, because they know that child. After so long of them being in your home... You know them. You know, I've only had my two younger ones for two years. It'll be two years in March. And, you know, we're going through the adoption process right now. But even after two years, I know them. I know those children through and through. And they're mine. The adoption hasn't gone through yet, but they're mine. Not long after they came into my home when we realized that reunification with the bio biological family was not going to happen, 
they were mine. I don't care what a piece of paper says. They were my daughters. And they exactly. They still are. Uh, two years later, and that's why we're going through with the adoption process. As soon as, you know, as soon as parental rights were were terminated, it was an instant. We were getting the meeting done because we knew for a fact that we wanted to adopt them before the rights were taken from their parents. Right. And and they'll go out into the world as adults knowing who they are, where they came from, and where they belong. Right. And, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of kids that get that. I know, as a foster parent, not even in the company I work for, but I know so many foster parents that are doing things for the right reason. I also know foster parents that are not doing it right. for the right reason. And, unfortunately, I mean, it's not, they're not abusing them or, you know, they're not in it for the money <clears throat> or else I, I would report them. It's more of a, they want to pass their beliefs on to more and more people. So they think if they get these young children, they can almost convert them, I guess. I don't know. It's, it's a strange situation, but it's nothing that I can report. Um, but I mean, there are tons of good foster homes but there are so many bad ones that you never really know exactly. where you're going to end up. You can't just assume that the child is going to go into a great home, but you also can't assume that they're going to go into a bad one. You can't go you can't have a child going in there assuming that they're they're going to be abused. But I think the older they get, they also need to be taught to protect themselves. Right. To speak out when something happens because a lot of them are conditioned not to say anything. And if you're an older foster kid and there's a younger one in the home that's being abused, speak out about that. Because that child, this like two-year-old Alex, she could not tell anybody what was going on. She couldn't explain to anybody the abuse that she was enduring for this entire, what, nine months? She didn't have a voice. And I, you know, that's another reason that we're doing this is we want to give children like this a voice before something like this happens again. Right. There are so many. I look it up. Google it. There are so many children that are dying every day. We had one here in Kentucky, um, a gay couple, they, um, one of them, he killed his foster child, um, and he's just now, uh, being indicted for it, I think. I think he's just now in jail and going to court. Oh, we're definitely gonna have to research that. Yeah, I mean, I, there won't be a lot of information, because like I said, it just right. happened recently, but... Yeah, I mean, it's happening every day. This isn't something that used to happen and no. we fixed it. Nothing in this system has been fixed. No. Nothing. These children are slipping through the cracks because they don't have enough homes. So they're just opening up random homes. They don't have enough caseworkers. These caseworkers are overloaded with children. I've seen it. They have... 10 or 12 cases or more to one caseworker, there's That's no unreal. way. It's impossible for the these caseworkers to keep up with all of the cases that they put on them the, in the way that they need to. You know, all the visits, all of the checkups, everything that they need to do, all of the inspections, it's impossible for them to do it with all of the cases that they have. They're, they're going to be kids that slip through the cracks. And something needs to be done about this. It's, it's something that can be helped. It's just something that nobody has really cared to help so far. We need to take the steps to make it happen. To make it stop. But it, become, it needs to become a bigger, a bigger thing. Like, 
more people need to talk about it. And I know it's a horrible subject. It's horrible for us to sit here and research this for hours. We go through these stories and we write down the notes and we type out the notes and these, these stories are in our heads and we know every detail. And then you talk to the parent and, and you find out how it felt and right. what they went through emotionally and mentally and and trust me as two women with mental health issues of their own this is not the easiest thing in the world to face but somebody needs to do it right it's a horrible subject but you, you need to be speaking about it speak out about foster care abuse um i think we've gotten ill enough for today um maybe yeah you cried and i got a little mad angry angry or i'm an angry person sometimes most of the time i'm an, i'm a very angry person can we end this on like some sort of a happy note of course of course like, let's try to oh yeah our mommy look at the beautiful necklaces our mommy got us and yes we're grown women and we call her mommy yes they are oil diffusers yeah they came with a bunch of these different um little felt things that you put you open it up and you put in it and you can put your essential oils uh on the felt thing and so you wear it around all day and right now we have um harmony in yes. here and oh. it's like a mood uplifter That's and uh, I, I can't we wait to wear it today. yeah i can't wait to wear it at work because i really need it there today um <laughs> so yeah um but I think that's it for this video. Um, hopefully we've made some sort of a step toward a difference. And hopefully we did make Mary proud with the way we came across with um, her story and her daughter's story. And Mary, if you're watching this, thank you so much yes. for allowing us to do this video and tell your daughter's story. Um, it means so much to us that you would allow us to do this. We're honored. We really are. So, I guess that's it for us today. Um, Hopefully, we'll see you next time. Yep. We'll see you next week. Bye, guys. Bye. It's been a long day without you, my friend. And I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. We've come a long way. From where we began Oh, I'll tell you all about it When I see you again When I see you again